Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Rohn. I was just going over our latest issue of our new magazine called The Achiever. I want to thank you for taking the time to spend just a few minutes with me today. I have a very interesting subject. I call it Five Simple Steps to Go from Average to Fortune. I've been asked to give it in many places for corporations and companies, and uh, now I have the opportunity to share it with you. It's a pretty big subject for someone like me. For my life started out rather modestly, uh, up in farm country in Idaho where I was raised. Uh, I grew up in this little community of some four or five thousand people, and uh, went to high school, graduated, went to college for a year and a half, and uh, then I quit, decided I was smart enough, and uh, got me a job to see if I couldn't make all of my ambitions come true. My parents, I think, gave me a very good foundation, a very good start. I was an only child, so I think they took some extra time with me and uh, got off to a pretty good start. A couple of years after I left school, I found a very beautiful young lady and persuaded her to marry me and uh, kept making all of those grand promises, as we're inclined to do that everything was going to work well and that she had made a wise decision. Well, two or three years after I'd gotten married, it didn't look like my new bride had made such a wise decision because I'm now starting to struggle. I've got far too much month at the end of the money, if you've ever known what that's like, and I'm wondering what to do. I'm behind on my bills. I'm willing to work hard. That's not my problem, but it isn't as going as well as I had thought it would up until that point. I'm struggling. And I'm wondering what to do. Should I go back to school and get some more education? Uh, I didn't have any capital to start a business. So all these questions were going through my mind at a time when I needed some answers. How to really become successful and how to turn my life around. Well, at age 25, good fortune came my way. And sometimes it's a little difficult to describe good fortune. Why do unique things happen to you when they do? Part of that's a mystery to me. I really don't know. One of my friends says, well, things don't just happen. They happen just. And maybe that's it. I really don't know. But my good fortune was at age 25, I met a very remarkable man. His name was Mr. Schof, Mr. Earl Schof. And he's the gentleman who gave me those last final answers that I had been looking for up until that time. Mr. Schof was a very unique gentleman. He was a businessman, an entrepreneur. He had several businesses. And he took a liking to me and he hired me and I went to work for him. I spent the next five years working for him. And then unfortunately at the end of that five years he died. But I did get to spend five years with this remarkable man and he's the gentleman who gave me the answers. He gave me the points and the ideas that helped to really turn my life around. And I will always be grateful for finding someone who took the time to share their information with me. Uh, the best thing Mr. Schof gave me was not a job. The best thing he gave me was the benefit of his philosophy. And fortunately for me, his philosophy worked for me. I practiced more of my time lecturing and sharing ideas on how to do better, how to make your life personally, socially, and economically work out better. And especially for the last six or seven years, I've had the opportunity to travel around the world. The seminar has been translated in many languages. And I find myself now spending the biggest share of my time lecturing, sharing ideas, and trying to come up with answers that can make a difference in your life. Let me give you this simple little talk, how to go from average to fortune. There's five simple steps. You might like to make a note of them. Here's the first one. Get serious. That's number one. I don't know any substitute for that. You've really got to get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you must be serious. I know a guy that's got a half a dozen jokes keeping him from becoming wealthy. He's not known as rich. He's known as a joker, which I guess is okay if that's the kind of life you want to live. But it really isn't the best way to live. To go from average to fortune, you must get serious. And you must get serious about two very important things. Number one is setting your goals and where you want to go. Designing the next five, the next 10 years is so vitally important. What do you want to do economically? Where do you want to go? What do you want to be? What would you like to have? What would you like to share? How much would you like to earn? How far would you like to go? Those are some major questions to ask. And for that all to work out like you want it to for the next five or 10 years, in my personal opinion, you've got to get serious. Then you have to get serious about another important subject. And that important subject is called 
personal development. Personal development is striving hard to become the kind of person that you want to be. And to become the kind of person you want to be, you've got to work at it. Ten years from now, you will surely become someone. The big question is, who? What are you becoming? And if you go to work on it now, sure enough, in a very short period of time, you can take on a new direction to become the kind of person you want to be. There's a very important question to ask, and the question is, ten years from now, you will surely arrive. And the question is, where? So to answer the question of where you want to arrive and the kind of person you want to be, you've got to get serious. So that's point number one. To make your life worthwhile and unique, to go from average to fortune, you've got to get serious. Now, the second point is get smart. To make your life work out worthwhile, you've got to have some ideas. You've got to have the information. So you've got to be smart. In fact, in this decade, you must be much smarter than you were in the last decade. You've got to read the books. You've got to come up with the information. When I have a chance to talk to the high school kids, that's the theme of my talk. Get smart. There's nothing worse than being stupid. And if you will read the books, learn from your experiences, do all the things that you possibly can to get the information, sure enough, you'll be wiser this year than you were last year. And I've got a few techniques that I teach in my seminar on how to get smarter, keeping a journal, going to the lectures, going to the seminars, listening to the sermons, picking up ideas from other people. You just must keep up this steady process of learning. Never cease your quest for knowledge. And that's one of the key points to go from average to fortune. Get smart. Now here's number three. You've got to get going. All of the things that you've learned will not do you that much good if you don't put it into an action plan. You've got to get going. In my management and leadership seminar, we teach game plans, how to put all the good things that you've learned into action, economic action, social action, personal action, how to make the changes and how to actually do the work, how to actually function. Get going, that's the key. Some people are ever learning, but they don't put it into action. They don't really take the action. It's like the man who keeps bringing materials to the building site and never builds anything. He keeps bringing in the sand and the gravel and the windows and the doors and the roofing material and he just stacks up all these supplies, but he never builds anything. See, if you do that long enough, fairly soon they'll come and take you away. You've got to do something with what you've learned. You've got to take action. You've got to get going. So that's one of the most important things to learn, how to design your days, how to design your weeks, how to design the months so that you take the proper action to get the proper return that you're looking for, whether it's economic or personal. Get going. It's a major key. Now here's number four. You must get excited. And not just the false enthusiasm of just pure positive thinking. You've got to get excited over some very basic things. One is get excited over your ability to make yourself do the necessary things. Because discipline is major step one toward personal progress. And any time a person wishes to, they can make major changes in their life, personally and socially and financially. It doesn't ever have to be the same after today. No telling what you could do today if you really wish to. The act of murder is a clear indication that a person in one drastic act can forever change the course of their life. It just happens to be in the negative direction. What I would ask you to do, starting today, is get excited about committing an act, an act that's positive, an act that's constructive, to make the changes in your life that you want made and to go the direction that you want to go. So that's number four, get excited. Get excited about your potential. Human capacity is usually never the problem. Little children can learn several languages. We can learn to do the most incredible things. All we need to do is take the time to do it. So it's not a matter of capacity. It's a matter of judgment. It's a matter of excitement. It's a matter of will. And it's a matter of wanting too bad enough. So it's pretty exciting to know that any day you wish, you can change your life. Any day you pick out, you can make major changes. It doesn't ever have to be the same again. And that's exciting. Knowing that intellectually and personally, you can actually do the things that will make major changes in your life. 
That's number four. Here's number five. Number five is get away. I have found, especially in the last 15, 20 years, that there's an important thing called life balance. You've got to learn to get away. You must learn to get away and be alone. Learn to get away and reflect. Learn to get away and learn how to live as well as how to earn. How sad it would be to learn how to earn well, but not learn how to live well. You must balance your life. We teach something, especially in my staff, I teach a, some, something called lifestyle. Lifestyle is how you learn to live your life. Some people have money, but they don't even know how to spend it. They have time, but they don't know how to spend it. Some people are successful, but they don't know how to spend their success. They don't know what to do with it. They don't get joy from it. Rather, they get animosity. A father takes $5, crushes it, and throws it at his son and says, if you need it that bad, take it. Now, it's the same $5, but instead of dispensing it with joy, he dispenses it with animosity. That's the difference in not knowing how to live. It's called lifestyle. Then you've got to take time to cultivate good friends. You've got to take time to be with your family. You've got to take time to be with the people who are important to you, designing your life in those respects. Get away. Take the time. Reflect on your life. Recharge your batteries. Do some growing away from your enterprise. Then when you come back to your enterprise, after you have taken this time to balance your life, you will find that on the job, working on your enterprise, things will really go much better. So those are the five simple steps to go from average to fortune. Get serious. Get smart. Get going. Get excited. And get away. I hope those points will be valuable for you as you consider them. And I want to thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time to spend just a little time with you. I would invite you to come and attend my seminar. If I get a chance to see you there, I'll be happy to meet you. Uh, we usually have several hundred to a thousand people attending the seminar, and I'd love to have you. I think I have some interesting things to share about life and about economics and how to do better. I've learned a lot these last uh, 15, 20 years, and I've capsulized it in one evening. It's from 7 to 11. It's four hours of some very interesting material. And I think you'd find it exciting. I've got some ideas to share. I don't claim they're right. I just claim they're my ideas. But if you'll take the time, if you'll spend an evening with me, I think you'll find it rewarding. And I want to thank you for giving me this uh, few minutes of your time. And for you giving me some of your time, I would just like to sincerely share this with you. Do not walk in front of me, I may not follow. Do not walk behind me, I may not lead. But walk beside me and be my friend. Thank you for listening. So, the key is time is precious. Now let me give you Bill Bailey's description of time. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, their frequency, and their intensity. Life is not just watching the clock tick away. Life is a collection of experiences, their intensity, their frequency. Whatever the span of your life turns out to be, here's what you want to fill it up with, experiences and the intensity of those experiences. But now let's talk about the management of time. When should you start the day? as soon as you have it finished. Plan the day the best you can, leaving plenty of room for improvising and surprises and all the stuff that happens during the course of the day. But if you've planned a good productive day, now you start that day, you can't believe how much more valuable your time will be. Don't start the day until you have it finished. Now here's the next one. Don't start the week until you've had it finished. Now to lay out a week is a pretty good challenge. Next, don't start the month until you have it finished. The places to go and the people to see and the productivity and the sales and the customers and the development and all the rest of what you want to accomplish during the course of 30 days. Don't start the month till it's finished. And then here's the big one. This is really challenging. Don't start the year until you have it 
finished. To the best of your ability, it can't be finished like minute by minute. But in terms of the sweep of what you want to accomplish, make sure that that's set and ready to go by the time January 1st rolls around. Now, jot this down. Approaches to the management of time. Here's the first one. Ignore the subject. I mean, that's good advice. Don't let anything overly bug you. Because remember now, you don't have to do anything. Someone says, well, I got to get a handle on my time. The answer is no, you don't. If you want to let it all go, you can let it all go. I mean, this is good advice. Somebody says, you ought, you ought, you ought. Jot this down. Ignore all the you oughts or you should. Only if they're giving general information, we should. It's better to say if you're teaching, we should. Not you should, we should. Then you let me listen in without it being too confrontational. If everyone did this, see, that'd be great. And then you give a person a chance to choose to do it or not to do it. But when you start the you ought, you ought, now see if I don't, now see we got some tension and maybe some problems. So you ought seem to always create problems. When you're talking to your kids, you say, no, if kids would do this, not always saying if you did this, if you did this, life would be better. But if kids did this, life would be better. It's like making a little talk and letting them listen in. And then it's a little less confrontational. It gives us a choice. In one of my seminars, here's what I teach. All life form strives to the max of its potential except human beings. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, trees don't grow half. A tree drives its roots as deep as it can, reaches as high as it can, produces every leaf it can, every fruit it possibly can. To the max, every life form strives to the max, except human beings. Now, why not human beings? Jot this down. You've been given the dignity of choice. You're not a robot. You don't have to repeat this year the same as last year. You can tear up last year's plan, develop a new plan. So, the dignity of being a human being. Now, here's the choice on being a human being. To be part of all we were meant to be, or to be all. To strive for all, or half, or part, or some. The choice is up to you. To develop one skill or ten skills. Someone says, well, I'd be happy with just one more language. Well, some say, hey, I'm going to learn six or seven. And this is all a matter of choice. And when someone says, no, you ought to learn four. You've got to resist all that. Because this is personal dignity. And you don't want to destroy someone's dignity by, by doing all the odds and they feel reluctant to do it. Now we've got problems. So if you want to, just ignore this subject on time management. Now here's the next one. Step down to something easier. The guy's in sales and he says, oh, I want to own the company. Finally owns the company. Now he's got no time to play golf. He said, when I was in sales, I was making big money playing golf three days a week. Heck with this owning something. Heck with managing. My life was never my own after I started to manage. I'm going back to sales. See, this is the key. If you're getting too pressed, you might consider stepping down to something with a little easier time pressure. Next key to time management. And that's work longer and harder. But see, there's a limit to that. I almost lost my health the first year. I went so crazy about personal development and achievement. I just went bonkers. You know, I told you I was skinny. By the end of that first year, I was a walking shadow. And then it suddenly occurred to me, what if I got rich and too ill to spend it? I mean, that was a shocker. So I started, you know, developing a little more reasonable. Because I said, if 12 hours won't do it, I'll work 14. If that won't do it, I'll work 18. I mean, how many hours it takes. And sure enough, it, it cost me too much. So see, working longer and harder for some might be appropriate. You know, if you're just sitting around not doing that much, this might be good, work longer and harder. But you can only work so hard. Here's the key, not to work harder, but smarter when you've worked as hard as you can doing the best you can in terms of physical output in the time reasonable time now here's the ultimate in the management of time and that is you simply become more skillful when i first got into sales you know i was around people that could get you know nine out of ten eight out of ten and when i first started i could only get one out of ten but here's what i did i worked around the clock around the clock so that I would make up in numbers what I lacked in skill. That's good in sales. You got to jot that down. When you're new, you make up in numbers what you lack in skill. Now, when you become more skillful, the numbers can go down because now 
your persuasive ability and all of that is now so high that you don't need to put as many numbers out. But at first, if you want to compete or if you want to really get good, you've got to put in the numbers. But if you get more from yourself, develop more of yourself, now the time management becomes an easier task. Now here's the next thing. Either you run the project or it runs you. I've found out when you start something, at first you're in charge. All of a sudden, a year later, it's in charge. Some of the companies I started, I'm telling you, I'm in control. A couple of years later, I'm out of control. At first, I've got it on the run. Two years later, it's got me on the run. Haven't got enough time. I'm dizzy with trying to get it all done. So here's part of the key, and that's to get in charge. Say, I'm going to take charge of my health. Take charge of your time. Take charge of your resources, which we're going to talk about next. You're the one that's responsible for it. It's not a requirement of society that you not have a heart attack and take care of your family. That's not a requirement of society, but you must make it a requirement of yourself. Society doesn't require that you build a financial wall around your family. Nothing can get through. That's not a requirement of society. It's a requirement you impose on yourself to build a financial wall around your family. Nothing can get through. So impose on yourself this self-development of being in charge, taking charge of your life and your health and your future and your responsibilities and all the rest. Next. Reasonable time is enough time to achieve all of your goals. Just jot that down. Reasonable time is enough time. I had to learn that. Reasonable time is enough time. Here's why. It's not the hours you put in, it's what you put in the hours. If you start depositing greater ideas into the hours you've got later than now, I'm telling you later, you can't believe the productivity that will flow. The ideas you can't think of now, a year from now, they'll start to flow. And when you deposit those ideas in the hours you've got, Productivity multiplies by two, three, five, ten. Next, time management essential. We've already covered the first one, a written set of goals. And then do priorities on your goals. What's important this week? What's important this month? Here's the next one. Often review. Just go over your goals to make sure that your list is working for you. It's got you inspired. It's got you turned on. Somebody says, how come you're up so early? Say, if you were headed where I'm headed, you'd be up early too. If you were going to meet who I'm going to meet, you'd be up early. If it was going to stack up for you like it's stacking up for me, you'd be getting up early. Here's some more time management essentials. Learn to study what we call majors and minors. You pick up the phone. Here's what you must say when you pick up the phone. Is this a major conversation or a minor conversation? If it's minor, a few pleasantries and you're done. If it's major, maybe you've got to make a few notes. So here's the next one. Important conversations, make an agenda before you make the call. Just jot down a little agenda. It's so easy now to just talk out of your head. Do you ever hear a conversation end like this? Like this. Let's see, there was something else. See, you don't look that swift. I can't think of it right now. I'll call you back. See, you look a little incompetent. Let's see, there was something. It escapes me right now. Really? So have you got this now? Make an agenda before you make a call if it's an important call. Now later that saves you all kinds of stuff. So what's major, what's minor? Now here's the key on this. Don't major in minor things. If you take up major time to do minor things, I'm telling you, you'll be behind the curve constantly. Here's what we learn in sales training. What's major time and what's minor time? And if you took a look, if you're in sales and you took a look at a week, you'd say, my gosh, I'm spending 90% of my time on the minor stuff and so little time on the major stuff in the presence of. How many hours in the presence of in my day? How many hours in the presence of during my sales week? Because the time that really counts is in the presence of majors and minors. Here's another key time management essential. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's easy to get faked out by being busy. Guy comes home at night all exhausted, falls in the chair and says, oh, I've been going, going, going. Here's the big question. Doing what? It's not the going, going, going. Some people are going, 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 and they're doing figure eights. Progress is small. So don't mistake movement for achievement. Now, here's a big one, concentration. 
I had to learn this. All those years ago, I'm in the shower trying to compose a letter. Found it turns out to be a strange letter. So here's what I learned to do. Save the work till you get to the office. Save the work till you get to the work. Don't try to get to the office on the way to work. On the way to work, enjoy the way. In the shower, enjoy the shower. Then go to work when you get to work. I found this to be helpful. Concentration. Here's another big one. Learn to say no. I'm telling you, in such a social society we have now, it's so easy to try to be a nice person saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Find yourself overloaded. Now you got to call and make the, well, gosh, you know, all the time it takes to back out of something that you said, said yes to too quickly. Here's what might be better. I don't think so, but if that changes, I'll call you. Little things you can use not to commit, overcommit yourself. My friend Ron Reynolds says, don't let your mouth overload your back. It's a good one. Now, here's a big one on time management. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. I used to take my family to the beach and I would bring my briefcase. I learned not to do that. Or at the beach, I'm saying I should be at the office. I should be at the office. Now my family's upset because I'm at the beach and I'm thinking office, office, office. Now when I'm at the office, I'm thinking what? I got to get my family to the beach, the beach, the beach. So things are not going too well at the office because I'm thinking beach and things are not going too well at the beach because I'm thinking office. Here's what I learned to do. At the beach, be at the beach. At the office, be at the office. When you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. Now here's one of the most important ones. Don't play at work. Work is too serious. But I'm telling you, you got to be serious about work because you're parting with a piece of your life for the work you do. Your work costs you a piece of your life. Here's what it's called. Serious business. Not grim, not unhappy, but serious. Here's another key phrase. All work is good. You may not like your job, but if it's the stepping stones to get you to where you want to, to go, you've got to appreciate your job. You don't have to have a passion for your job. Here's the ultimate passion. A passion for incredible success in every department of my life. That's the passion. But don't look down on some menial job you have to do to finally get you to where you want to go. No job is menial. Menial. No job is not. No, every job is noble. Training life for pay. Making a contribution to society. Next. Analyze how you are. And if you have some weaknesses, if you can't, doesn't seem like you can change, here's the key. Get it covered. I used to keep promising myself I'd keep the books, keep the books, keep the books. Finally, I gave that up. And back then, it only took me an extra 50, 60 bucks a month for some accountant to keep the books. I said, no, I'm going to save the 50 bucks. You can't believe what I started losing in productivity because I tried to save the 50 bucks. So the key is a lot of the time you can stay like you are, but just make sure you get it covered. Next. Beware of the telephone and all other systems of communication, especially the telephone at home and systems of communication at home. And here's one of the best lines I've got for you for the weekend. Let all communication systems serve you, but don't let them intrude. Here's the next one. Read all the books. You know, I've only got a few notes here on time management. But if you've got some particular challenges, you run a big organization, a big corporation, you've got some challenges, there's plenty of books. Now, here's what's next. Just be more alert to the things that might be stealing your time. Here's why. Time is like capital. You can't let someone steal your seed corn. You can't let someone steal your capital. And you can't let someone steal your time. You must designate your time. And some of the time that you designate, you must not let anyone steal. Casual time, you might let someone intrude and steal a little bit and take a little bit, but not serious time. Next, one of the great time management savers is to learn to ask questions up front. Sometimes you talk to somebody for an hour, and then you ask questions and find out if you would have asked those questions up front, you could have saved yourself an hour. Asking questions up front helps you to get to the problem now. But if you just launch into some discourse, you might waste 30 minutes, waste an hour, when here's what you should have been talking about. After you've finished an hour, you say, John, what's really the problem? He said, well, it's something personal. See, that's what you should have been talking about this whole hour. Now, here's the last one, thinking on paper, and that's to keep a journal. One of the things I'm known for around the world, have been now for 39, 40 years, is keeping a journal. Now, my journal is not a, you know, it's not necessarily a, it's not like a diary. It might be part diary. 
You know, I'm flying over Ireland and I, I write down a few little things that impress me. Uh, today I met this person. Wow, what an extraordinary event. Uh, today this, I conducted this seminar in Rome. A thousand people stood up and sang for me. I've got a little bit of a diary in there. But here's what primarily your journal is for. Collecting good ideas. A journal is to collect good ideas on your health, good ideas for your business, good ideas for your future, good ideas for time management. Because I used to take notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes and restaurant placemats. And I threw all this stuff in a drawer. It did not serve me well. I finally learned to get a bound copy. Right? And just keep a journal. Right? If I was here, I had my journal, I'd be taking notes. Right? These two days in my journal. Now, if you're caught without your journal, you just take the notes when you get back home. Put those notes in your journal, throw the paper away. Because we don't usually go through paper to review. But see, my journals now make up a significant part of my own library. Here's what's next to leave behind, and that's your library. The books that changed your life, the books that changed your health, the books that rescued you from oblivion, the books that you passed on to other people, they were so exciting for you, the books that made you financially independent, the books that developed your leadership, the books that gave you wisdom to ponder when things were tough, the books that got you through the winter, the books that helped you to plant in the spring and harvest in the fall. What a treasure to leave behind. If you do that, here's what's for sure. Your books will be more valuable than your furniture. In the immortal wisdom of the legendary Jim Rohn, let this be the moment where you step into the extraordinary. This channel is your sanctuary of empowerment, your compass for personal growth, and your guide through the intricacies of becoming the architect of your destiny. In the spirit of Jim's timeless teachings, we're here to unravel the mysteries, celebrate the miracles, and delve deep into the majesty of your potential. So, as we embark on this transformative voyage together, get ready to absorb the invaluable lessons that will shape not just your actions, but the very essence of who you are. Welcome to a place where every video is a key to unlocking the magic within you. Let the journey unfold. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed friends, welcome to this profound journey of self-discovery and personal development. In this expanded exploration, we'll delve even deeper into the transformative power of decision-making and the art of setting meaningful goals. As we navigate the intricate landscapes of life, it's essential to understand the fundamental truth that our lives are not determined by external circumstances, but by the decisions we make and the actions we take. In the words of a great philosopher, the only limits to the possibilities in your life tomorrow are the buts you use today. Let's start by unpacking the concept of decision-making. Decisions are the steering wheel of our lives guiding us through the myriad possibilities and potential pitfalls. Every decision, no matter how seemingly insignificant, sets in motion a series of events that shape our experiences and determine the direction of our journey. Consider the power vested in the act of decision-making. It's not just about choosing between options, it's about taking ownership of your life. Decisions are the sculptor's tools carving out the contours of your destiny. Embrace the responsibility that comes with decision-making, for it is the key that unlocks the door to personal empowerment. Now let's transition to the art of goal, setting a cornerstone of the transformative journey. Goals are not mere checkpoints on life's journey. They are the compass points that guide us toward our desired destinations. The process of setting goals is not just a strategic exercise. It's a profound act of self-discovery and a commitment to personal growth. Consider the significance of setting meaningful goals that align with your values and aspirations. A well-defined goal serves as a lighthouse, cutting through the fog of uncertainty and providing clarity on the path ahead. It's not merely about achieving an outcome. It's about becoming the person capable of realizing that outcome. As you embark on the journey of setting goals, remember that the quality of your goals influences the quality of your life. 
Aim for goals that resonate with your authentic self, goals that stretch your capabilities and invite you to transcend your current limitations. The transformative journey is not just about reaching destinations. It's about evolving into the person capable of conquering new horizons. Now, let's explore the psychology behind effective goal setting. Goals, when crafted with intention and clarity, become powerful drivers of motivation. The process of setting goals ignites a sense of purpose, infusing your actions with meaning and direction. When you have a compelling why behind your goals, the how becomes a journey of self-discovery and growth. Consider incorporating the SMART criteria into your goal-setting process. Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Specific goals provide clarity. Measurable goals offer tangible markers of progress. Achievable goals maintain motivation. Relevant goals align with your values. And time-bound goals create a sense of urgency. As you set your sights on ambitious objectives, remember that the journey is just as significant as the destination. The pursuit of a goal is an odyssey of growth, self-discovery, and the cultivation of resilience. Think of a goal not just in terms of what you will achieve, but more importantly, in terms of who you will become in the process. Now let's delve into the concept of visualization as a potent tool in the goal setting process. Visualization involves creating a mental image of your desired outcome, engaging your senses, emotions, and beliefs in the process. It's not just wishful thinking. It's a strategic practice that aligns your subconscious mind with your conscious goals. Close your eyes and vividly imagine the realization of your goal. See the details, feel the emotions, and internalize the belief that it is not a matter of if, but when. Visualization is a practice embraced by athletes, entrepreneurs, and high achievers across various fields. It serves as a bridge between your current reality and the future you aspire to create. As you embark on the transformative journey of goal setting, recognize the importance of adaptability. Life is dynamic and circumstances may change. Embrace the flexibility to adjust your goals when necessary while staying committed to the essence of your vision. The transformative journey is not a rigid march but a dance with the rhythm of life. As we navigate the ebb and flow of life, resilience becomes our steadfast companion. Life in its infinite wisdom presents us with challenges, setbacks, and unforeseen circumstances. How we respond to these challenges defines our character and shapes our destiny. Resilience is not just about weathering the storm. It's about harnessing the storm's energy to propel you forward. Think of a setback not as a roadblock, but as a detour leading you to new perspectives, insights, and strengths you never knew you possess. The transformative journey is not a smooth, linear path, but a dynamic dance with the rhythms of personal growth. Consider the analogy of a tree standing tall in a storm. The winds may blow and the branches may sway, but the deeply rooted tree remains unshaken. In the same way, Resilience is about anchoring yourself in your core values and beliefs, allowing the winds of change to shape you without uprooting your foundation. Now let's explore the different dimensions of resilience. Emotional resilience involves acknowledging and navigating through the spectrum of emotions that accompany life's challenges. It's not about suppressing emotions, but understanding them, learning from them, and using them as stepping stones for growth. Cognitive resilience is the ability to maintain clarity of thought and focus in the face of adversity. It's about reframing challenges as opportunities for learning and finding solutions amidst chaos. The resilient mind sees setbacks as temporary and setbacks as setups for future success. Social resilience emphasizes the importance of our connections with others. Cultivating a strong support system fostering positive relationships, and seeking help when needed are integral aspects of social resilience. 
In the interconnected web of humanity, we draw strength from our bonds with others. Now, let's discuss the transformative power of embracing challenges. Every challenge, whether big or small, carries within it the seeds of growth. It's in the crucible of challenge that our character is forged and our potential is revealed. Embrace challenges not as obstacles, but as opportunities for self-discovery and resilience. Consider the concept of post-traumatic growth. The idea that individuals can emerge stronger and wiser from adversity. It's not the absence of challenges that marks a successful journey, but the ability to overcome them with grace and determination. Resilience, therefore, is not just a reactive response. It's a proactive approach to life's uncertainties. As you navigate the transformative journey, cultivate the mindset of a lifelong learner. Embrace each experience, whether positive or negative, as an opportunity to gain wisdom and insights. The transformative journey is a continuous process of evolution, a dynamic dance with the rhythms of personal growth. Consider the analogy of a sculptor chiseling away at a block of marble. With each strike, a piece of the unnecessary is removed, revealing the true beauty within. Similarly, with every goal pursued and every obstacle overcome, we chip away at the layers that obscure our authentic selves. The transformative journey is a continuous process of sculpting, refining, and revealing the masterpiece that is you. Now let's explore the interconnectedness of resilience with adaptability. Resilience is not a rigid resistance to change, but a flexible response to it. Life is dynamic and circumstances may shift. Embrace the adaptability to adjust your sails while staying true to the course of your values and aspirations. Our habits, whether constructive or detrimental, wield significant influence over the trajectory of our lives. They are the building blocks of our character, the architects of our successes, and at times the silent saboteurs of our aspirations. The transformative journey calls for a conscientious examination of our habits, a commitment to cultivating those that align with our goals and discarding those that hinder our progress. Consider the profound truth that your habits are not just actions. They are rituals that shape your identity. The habits you cultivate on a daily basis, whether consciously or unconsciously, contribute to the narrative of who you are the transformative journey invites you to be the author of a story characterized by purposeful habits that align with your values and aspirations. Now, let's delve into the concept of self-discipline, the bridge between goals and accomplishments. In the pursuit of personal development, self-discipline is not just a virtue. It is a necessity. It's the commitment to doing what needs to be done even when the initial enthusiasm wanes. Cultivate the habit of self-discipline, for it is the cornerstone upon which the edifice of success is built. Consider self-discipline as a form of self-love. It's not about depriving yourself of pleasure, but about making choices that align with your long-term well-being and goals. The transformative journey involves acknowledging the transient nature of motivation and embracing the unwavering commitment that self-discipline provides. As you navigate the intricacies of self-discipline, recognize the importance of establishing routines. Routines create a structured framework for your day, minimizing decision fatigue and freeing up mental bandwidth for more significant tasks. The transformative journey is not a chaotic sprint but a purposeful marathon, and routines provide the necessary structure for enduring success. Now, let's transition to the concept of the growth mindset, a paradigm that distinguishes between those who thrive on challenges and those who shy away from them. The transformative journey involves embracing a growth mindset, one that sees challenges as opportunities, failures as lessons, and setbacks as setups for comebacks. Consider the transformative power of your beliefs about intelligence and talent. 
A fixed mindset assumes that intelligence and talent are static traits leading individuals to avoid challenges and give up easily in the face of obstacles. On the other hand, a growth mindset views intelligence and talent as qualities that can be developed through dedication and hard work, fostering a love for learning and resilience in the face of adversity. Now let's explore the role of affirmations in shaping your mindset. Affirmations are not mere words. They are declarations of intent that have the potential to reprogram your subconscious mind. Affirm daily that you are capable, resilient, and destined for greatness. As you sow the seeds of positivity in your mind, you will reap the fruits of a mindset that attracts success and abundance. Consider the transformative journey as a continuous process of unlearning and relearning. The growth mindset invites you to challenge limiting beliefs, embrace failures as stepping stones to success, and view effort as the path to mastery. As you embody a growth mindset, challenges become opportunities for growth, and setbacks become launch pads for future achievements. In the grand symphony of life, the transformative journey is not a solitary endeavor, but a communal experience. Consider the impact of your habits, self-discipline, and growth mindset on those around you. As you cultivate positive habits, demonstrate self-discipline, and embody a growth mindset, you become a source of inspiration for those who witness your journey. Think about the ripple effect of your transformative journey on your community and beyond. The principles of personal development, when embraced collectively, have the potential to create a ripple effect of positive change. Engage in initiatives that uplift, support, and inspire, recognizing that the transformative journey is not just about personal growth. Consider the but subtle about contributing but to the well-being of, of the world that around that shapes us. our attitudes, beliefs, and aspirations. The transformative journey invites us to be discerning about the company we keep, the books we read, and the ideas we entertain. Surround yourself with individuals who uplift, inspire, and challenge you to reach new heights. Reflect on the individuals who have had a significant influence on your life. What qualities do they possess? How have they shaped your perspective and choices? The transformative power of positive influence lies not only in the external guidance it provides, but in the internal transformation it sparks. As you engage with positive influences, be mindful of the reciprocal impact you may have on others. Now let's explore the transformative journey through the lens of continuous learning, a commitment to intellectual and personal growth. In a world that is constantly evolving, the commitment to lifelong learning is not just an asset, but a pre- Stay curious, explore new horizons, and be open to the infinite possibilities that unfold when you embrace the role of a perpetual student. Consider the transformative power of learning from diverse sources. Books, podcasts, courses, and conversations. Each avenue of learning contributes to the richness of your understanding. The transformative journey involves breaking out of intellectual comfort zones, challenging preconceived notions, and embracing the expansive world of knowledge that awaits. As we navigate the intricate landscapes of personal development, let's acknowledge the importance of gratitude. Gratitude is not just a pleasant sentiment, but a transformative force that enhances our well-being and attracts more of what we appreciate into our lives. Cultivate the habit of gratitude, for it is the alchemy that turns ordinary moments into extraordinary blessings. Now let's delve into the concept of the perpetual student mindset an approach to life that recognizes every experience as an opportunity to learn. The transformative journey is not about reaching a destination of knowledge, but about adopting a mindset that views the journey itself as a continuous education. As you embody the perpetual student mindset, every challenge becomes a lesson, every setback an opportunity for growth. Consider the transformative power of curiosity the perpetual student mindset is fueled by an insatiable curiosity about the world 
and a genuine interest in understanding diverse perspectives. Ask questions, seek answers, and approach every situation with the curiosity of a child discovering the world for the first time. Now let's explore the profound impact of mentorship on the transformative journey. A mentor, whether in person or through the wisdom found in books, serves as a guide, a source of inspiration, and a repository of knowledge. Seek out mentors who align with your values and aspirations, individuals whose journeys resonate with your own. As you engage in mentorship, consider the reciprocal nature of the relationship. The transformative journey is not just about receiving guidance, but about becoming a mentor yourself. Share your insights, experiences, and lessons learned with those who are on earlier steps of their journeys. In the grand tapestry of personal development, mentorship weaves threads of wisdom and experience that connect generations. Consider the impact of your journey on those around you. As you ascend your metaphorical mountains, you inspire others to embark on their paths of self-discovery. Your resilience becomes a beacon of hope and your determination serves as a roadmap for others navigating their paths. The transformative journey is not solitary. It ripples through the fabric of communities, leaving a legacy of inspiration and empowerment. Reflect on the communities you are a part of, be it your family, workplace, or broader social circles. The transformative power of community impact lies in recognizing the interconnectedness of our journeys. Your actions, choices, and contributions influence the collective well-being of those around you. Engage in initiatives that uplift, support, and inspire, recognizing that the transformative journey is not just about personal growth, but about contributing to the well-being of the world around us. Now let's explore the transformative power of legacy. The narrative that continues beyond our individual journeys. Your transformative journey is not just about the present moment. It's about the stories you weave, the values you embody, and the impact you leave on future generations. Consider the legacy you wish to create and the principles you want to pass down as a beacon of guidance. Legacy is not about the accumulation of wealth or fame, but about the imprint you leave on the hearts and minds of others. The transformative journey involves aligning your actions with your values, contributing to causes that resonate with your beliefs, and leaving behind a legacy that reflects the essence of who you are. Now let's delve into the transformative power of leadership. Leadership is not a title, but a responsibility to inspire, guide, and empower those within your sphere of influence. Your transformative journey equips you with the insights and qualities necessary to be a catalyst for positive change in the workplace, in your community, and beyond. Consider the qualities of effective leadership, empathy, integrity, vision and the ability to inspire others to reach their full potential. The transformative journey involves recognizing the leadership potential within yourself and cultivating the skills necessary to lead with authenticity and impact. As you navigate the intricacies of leadership, consider the concept of servant leadership. A servant leader prioritizes the well-being and development of those they lead viewing leadership as a service to others. The transformative journey involves embracing the humility to serve, the wisdom to lead with empathy, and the courage to foster an environment where everyone can thrive. Reflect on the leaders who have inspired you throughout your journey. What qualities do they possess? How have they impacted your perspective and choices? The transformative power of leadership lies not just in the external guidance it provides, but in the internal transformation it sparks. As you embrace leadership roles, be mindful of the profound influence you may have on the growth and development of those under your guidance. Now let's explore the transformative impact of your journey on future generations. The stories we weave, the challenges we overcome, and the triumphs we achieve serve as a narrative that shapes the perspectives of those who come after us. Your transformative journey 
becomes a living testament to the idea that obstacles are not roadblocks, but stepping stones on the path to greatness. Consider the concept of generativity, the desire to contribute to the well-being of future generations. The transformative journey involves recognizing the interconnectedness of our lives with those who will inherit the world we shape today. Engage in actions that contribute to a positive, sustainable, and empowered The transformative journey is a symphony of self-discovery, resilience, and growth. It's about recognizing the beauty in the process, not just the destination. As you navigate the peaks and valleys, remember that every step, every obstacle, and every triumph is a brushstroke on the canvas of your life. Embrace the journey, for in it lies the profound and continuous transformation that makes life truly extraordinary. Lifelong learning is not just about acquiring knowledge. It's about evolving into the person capable of embracing the ever-changing landscape of existence. The transformative journey is not a destination, but a perpetual exploration of the boundless possibilities that unfold when we commit to being lifelong students of life. Consider the transformative power of curiosity, the childlike wonder that propels us to ask questions, explore new horizons, and challenge our existing paradigm. The transformative journey involves nurturing and preserving this curiosity as we age, recognizing it as the engine that drives the continuous expansion of our understanding and the broadening of our perspectives. As we navigate the transformative journey, Let's acknowledge the importance of gratitude. Gratitude is not just a pleasant sentiment, but a transformative force that enhances our well-being and attracts more of what we appreciate into our lives. Cultivate the habit of gratitude, for it is the alchemy that turns ordinary moments into extraordinary blessings. Now let's explore the ripple effect of transformation. The transformative journey is not a solitary endeavor but a communal experience. Consider the impact of your journey on those around you. Your actions, choices, and the way you navigate challenges become a source of inspiration for others. Your resilience becomes a beacon of hope, and your determination serves as a roadmap for others navigating their paths. The transformative journey involves recognizing the interconnectedness of our lives, understanding that the positive changes we make within ourselves have the potential to create a ripple effect that extends far beyond our individual experience. Think about the profound influence you can have on your community and beyond. Engage in initiatives that uplift, support, and inspire, recognizing that the transformative journey is not just about personal growth, but about contributing to the well-being of the world around us. The transformative power of collective efforts can create a wave of positive change that transforms not only individuals, but entire communities. Reflect on the concept of legacy. Your transformative journey is not just about the present moment. It's about the stories you weave, the values you embody, and the impact you leave on future generations. Legacy is not about the accumulation of wealth or fame but about the imprint you leave on the hearts and minds of others. Consider the legacy you wish to create and the principles you want to pass down as a beacon of guidance. The transformative journey involves aligning your actions with your values, contributing to causes that resonate with your beliefs, and leaving behind a legacy that reflects the essence of who you are. Now, let's explore the interconnectedness of resilience with adaptability. Resilience is not a rigid resistance to change, but a flexible response to it. Life is dynamic and circumstances may shift. Embrace the adaptability to adjust your sails while staying true to the course of your values and aspirations. In conclusion, my esteemed audience, the transformative journey is not a destination but a continuous process of self-discovery resilience. Embrace the journey, recognizing that the art of lifelong learning 
and the ripple effect of transformation are not just concepts, but guiding principles that illuminate the path to a purposeful and impactful life. May your transformative journey be characterized by a commitment to lifelong learning, gratitude, and the awareness of the ripple effect of positive change. Thank you for joining me on this profound exploration. As we continue our journey, let's unravel the next layers of personal development focusing on the transformative power of influence, continuous learning, and the perpetual student mindset. Ladies and gentlemen, today I want to invite you on a journey. It's not a journey through space or time, but rather through the landscapes of our own minds and lives. I promise you this, by the end of our time together, you'll never see your life the same way again. You see, life is a canvas, and our perceptions are the colors with which we paint. Often we find ourselves using the same shades, the same strokes, the way we've been taught or the way we've always done it. But what if I told you that within you lies an untapped reservoir of potential, waiting just for a shift in perspective to come to life? I want to talk to you about the power that lies in a single moment, a single decision to see the world differently. Think of it. Every great adventure begins with a decision, a decision to step out the door, to look beyond the horizon. That's where transformation begins. It begins the moment you decide that the status quo is no longer enough, that the familiar paths no longer lead to the destinations you yearn to reach. Throughout history, there have been individuals, just like you and me, who have encountered these crossroads. They stood where you stand today, at the precipice of change, contemplating the same fundamental question. Do I dare to see my world differently? Now I want you to imagine a world where every setback is a setup for a comeback, where every challenge is not a roadblock, but a stepping stone. This is not just fanciful thinking. It's the breeding ground for growth, innovation, and transformation. It's where ordinary people achieve extraordinary things. In this journey together, I'm going to share stories of those who dared to dream who dared to see their world differently, and in doing so, changed not only their lives, but the lives of countless others. These aren't just tales of success and triumph. They are maps to hidden treasures within each of us. We'll delve into the essence of perspective, how a change in view can turn obstacles into opportunities, how a shift in mindset can transform our fears into frontiers of possibility. It's about seeing the unseen, believing in the unbelievable, and achieving the unachievable. As we embark on this journey, I ask you to open your minds and hearts. Be willing to challenge your long-held beliefs, to question the familiar paths, and to embrace the unknown. For in the unknown lies the power to rewrite your story, to paint your... Remember, the greatest journey you'll ever embark on is the journey within. It's a journey to the center of your own soul, to the heart of your own potential, and on this journey, you'll find that the most significant changes happen not around you, but within Ladies and gentlemen, get ready. You're about to see your life in a light you've never seen before. And once you do, you'll never look back. The journey to seeing your life new starts now. Let's take that first step together. Let's delve a bit deeper into this concept. It's often said that life is 10 what happens to us, and 90 is how we react to it. This is the essence of perspective. It's not just about seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. It's about choosing a viewpoint that empowers and uplifts us even in the face of adversity. Imagine for a moment a rough diamond. To an untrained eye, it may appear unremarkable, just another stone. But to a skilled jeweler, it's a gem of incredible value waiting to be polished and revealed. This is what perspective does. It reveals the value and potential in our lives that we might otherwise overlook. Now let's talk about the power of a positive outlook. Positivity is not about ignoring life's difficulties. It's about facing them with a mindset that allows for growth and resilience. It's about seeing the rain, but also looking for the rainbow that follows. Consider the story of a farmer who faced the most unpredictable weather. One year, there was a severe drought, and his crops barely grew. His neighbors lamented his bad luck, but the farmer simply said, good luck, bad luck, who knows? The following year, there were 
plentiful rains and his crops flourished. Again, his neighbors praised his good fortune, but he responded in the same way, good luck, bad luck, who knows? This story teaches us that life's events are not inherently good or bad. It's our perspective that gives them meaning. This perspective is not just about individual gain. It's about seeing the bigger picture, understanding that every experience, every challenge has a role to play in the grand tapestry of our lives. It's about recognizing that our actions, driven by our perspective, not only shape our lives, but also impact those around us. Now let's consider the concept of mindset. Our mindset is the mental attitude that predetermines our responses and interpretations of situations. It's the foundation upon which our perspective is built, cultivating a growth mindset. One that embraces challenges, persists in the face of setbacks, sees effort as the path to mastery, learns from criticism, and finds lessons and inspiration in the success of others can significantly alter our life's trajectory. But how do we shift our perspective? It begins with self-awareness, recognizing our habitual thoughts and questioning their validity. It involves stepping out of our comfort zones, challenging our limiting beliefs, and being open to new ideas and experiences. It requires us to be mindful, to live in the present moment, and to appreciate the journey, not just the destination. As we continue to explore this theme, I want you to reflect on the following questions. How does my perspective shape my experience of life? Am I viewing my challenges as burdens or as opportunities for growth? How can I shift my perspective to empower myself and those around me? And the answers to these questions lie within you. They're the keys to unlocking a life of fulfillment, joy, and purpose. Remember, the lens through which you view the world shapes your reality. Choose a lens that magnifies the good, that focuses on possibilities, and that sees challenges as opportunities to grow and excel. As we journey further into the heart of transformation, let us turn our focus to a vital aspect of life's journey. The role of challenges in personal growth. Challenges, my friends, are not mere obstacles in our path. They are the crucibles in which our character is forged and our dreams are tempered. Think for a moment about the greatest achievements in history, the most inspiring stories of personal triumph. Behind each of these stories lies a tapestry of challenges, struggles, and setbacks. These challenges are not just hurdles to be overcome. They are opportunities for growth, for learning, for becoming the best versions of ourselves. Let's consider the nature of a challenge. A challenge is essentially a call to action, a demand for us to rise to the occasion. It asks us to dig deep, to tap into our reservoirs of strength, determination, and resilience. When we face a challenge head on, we grow, we expand our capabilities, we discover new strengths, and we develop a deeper sense of self-confidence. I, for example, the story of a young woman who dreamed of becoming an Olympic athlete. From a young age, she faced numerous setbacks, injuries, defeats, and criticisms. Yet, with each setback, she rose stronger, more determined. Her challenges did not define her. They refined her. They honed her skills, strengthened her resolve, and deepened her passion. Ultimately, her journey through these challenges led her to achieve her dream, not just because she was talented, but because she was tempered by adversity. Now, let's talk about the mindset that transforms challenges into stepping stones. It begins with embracing the challenge. This does not mean enjoying difficulty for its own sake, but rather, it means accepting that challenges are an integral part of the journey and approaching them with a mindset of learning and growth. Each challenge we face is a question posed by life, and how we answer that question determines our path forward. Do we shrink back in fear and doubt, or do we step forward with courage and determination? The choice is ours, and it is in making this choice that we grow. Furthermore, challenges teach us the value of perseverance. There is a saying that the darkest hour is just before dawn. In the midst of our struggles, it can be hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But it is in persevering through these dark hours that we witness the breaking of a new dawn the dawn of our success and achievement. 
In embracing challenges, it is also crucial to cultivate resilience. Resilience is not about never falling. It's about learning how to rise every time we fall. It's about building the mental and emotional toughness to withstand the storms of life. And like any muscle, resilience grows stronger with use. As we reflect on the role of challenges in our lives, let us also consider the importance of perspective, which we discussed earlier. Our perspective on challenges can make all the difference. When we view challenges as opportunities for growth, we open ourselves to the possibilities of learning and improvement. We transform our struggles into stories of triumph. In this journey, you will encounter challenges, both big and small. When you do, I encourage you to ask yourself, what can I learn from this? How can this challenge make me stronger, wiser, and more capable? Approach each challenge with a mindset of growth, and you will turn your battles into victory. As we continue our journey, remember this. Challenges are not the end of the road. They are the road. They are the path through which we travel to reach our highest potential. Embrace them, learn from them, and let them lead you to heights you never thought possible. As we continue on this path of transformation and growth, let us turn our attention to a critical element of personal development. The journey of self-discovery, this journey is not just a path we walk. It is the essence of our existence, the core of our... It's about uncovering who we truly are, what we truly want, and what we're truly capable of achieving. Self-discovery is a voyage into the deepest waters of our souls, a quest to uncover the treasures that lie within. It's a journey that asks us to be brave, to question, to explore, and most importantly, to listen, to listen to the inner voice that whispers our true desires and aspirations. Why is self-discovery so vital? Because without knowing who we are, we can never truly know what we want or how to achieve it. We wander through life, driven by external expectations and societal norms, often losing touch with our inner selves. But when we embark on this journey of self-discovery, we begin to align our external world with our internal truths. We start to live lives that are not just successful on the surface, but deeply fulfilling at the core. Consider the story of an artist who, for years, worked in a corporate job successful by conventional standards but deeply unfulfilled. It was only when she took the time to explore her passion for art that she discovered her true calling. This journey of self-discovery led her to a career that was not only financially rewarding, but also immensely satisfying to her soul. Her story teaches us that when we align our actions with our true selves, we unlock a level of success and fulfillment that is otherwise unreachable. The journey of self-discovery is not always easy. It requires us to confront our fears, to challenge our limiting beliefs, and to step out of our comfort zones. But it is in these moments of discomfort that we find our greatest strengths and our truest selves. Self-discovery also involves exploring our values and beliefs. What do we stand for? What is non-negotiable in our lives? Understanding our core values gives us a compass to guide our decisions, ensuring that we stay true to ourselves in all our endeavors. Another crucial aspect of self-discovery is recognizing and embracing our unique talents and abilities. Each of us has a unique set of skills and talents, a unique contribution to make to the world. When we discover and harness these gifts, we not only enrich our own lives, but also contribute to the betterment of those around us. How do we embark on this journey of self-discovery? It starts with introspection. Take time to reflect on your experiences, your reactions, your dreams, and your fears. Journaling, meditation, and quiet contemplation are powerful tools in this process. It also involves seeking new experiences. Step out of your routine, try new things, meet new people. Each new experience is an opportunity to learn more about yourself to uncover aspects of your character and interests that you may not have been aware of. Throughout this journey, be patient with yourself. Self-discovery is not a destination. It's a lifelong process. It's about continually evolving, growing, and adapting. Embrace each discovery about yourself as a step towards a more authentic and fulfilling life. As we move forward, remember this. The journey of self-discovery is the most important journey you will ever undertake. It's the journey to the heart of who you are. And when you find yourself, you find the key 
to unlocking your greatest potential, your deepest passions, and your highest achievements. As we venture deeper into our exploration of transformation and growth, we arrive at a pivotal aspect of this journey, the importance of embracing change and taking decisive action. Life, in all its complexity and beauty, is in a constant state of flight. It is an ever-evolving tapestry of experiences, opportunities, and challenges. To navigate this dynamic landscape successfully, we must not only accept change, but embrace it as a catalyst for growth and transformation. Consider for a moment the nature of change. It is often met with resistance, fear, and uncertainty. We cling to the familiar, to the comfort of our routines and known outcomes. However, it is in stepping out of our comfort zones, in embracing the unknown, that we uncover our true potential. Change challenges us to adapt, to grow, and to reinvent ourselves. It is the soil in which the seeds of personal growth are Take the story of a successful businessman who, after years of climbing the corporate ladder, found himself at a crossroads. The path he had been traveling no longer brought him fulfillment. Despite the risks, he chose to embrace change to follow his passion for environmental conservation. This decision led him to start a venture that not only became financially successful, but also made a significant positive impact on the planet. His story is a testament to the power of embracing change and the extraordinary possibilities that lie on the other side of But embracing change is only half the equation. The other equally important half is taking action, dreams, and aspirations no matter how inspiring, remain mere fantasies without action. It is through action that we turn our visions into reality, our potential into achievement. Action, however, requires courage. It requires stepping into the unknown, taking risks, and being willing to face failure. Remember, every great achievement in history was once considered impossible until someone dared to take that first. It was the action the willingness to move forward despite the odds that turned the impossible. Consider the remarkable journey of an athlete who despite facing numerous injuries and setbacks, never gave up on her dream to compete at the highest level. Carry her relentless pursuit, her unwavering commitment to take action every day led her to not only compete, but also to triumph in the international arena her story is a powerful reminder that persistent, consistent action is the key to achieving our goals. As we embrace change and take action, it's essential to cultivate a mindset of resilience and adaptability. Change is often unpredictable, and our paths to success are rarely linear. We must be prepared to adjust our course, to learn from our experiences, and to keep moving forward, even when the road gets tough. Taking action also means being proactive in our lives. It's about creating opportunities rather than waiting for them to come to us. It's about being the architect of our destiny, not just a passenger on the journey of life. In this pursuit, remember the importance of setting clear goals. Goals give our actions direction and purpose. They provide a roadmap to guide our journey and a measure to gauge our progress. But these goals should not be set in stone. They should be flexible, adaptable to the ever-changing dynamics of our lives. As we reflect on the power of embracing change and taking action, let us also remember the role of discipline and consistency. Success is not achieved in a day, but over days, weeks, months, and years of consistent effort. It's the small daily actions compounded over time that lead to monumental results. As we draw near the close of our time together, Let's reflect on the journey we've embarked upon. We've explored the transformative power of perspective, the invaluable role of challenges in personal growth, the enlightening path of self-discovery, and the vital importance of embracing change and taking action. Each of these elements, woven together, creates a tapestry of transformation, a blueprint for a life of fulfillment, purpose, and achievement. Now we stand at a pivotal moment the moment of transformation, this is not just a point in time. It's a shift in being, a new way of seeing the world and ourselves within it. It's the moment when we realize that we have the power to shape our destiny, to turn our dreams into reality. Transformation is not an external process. It begins with, it starts with a decision to see things differently, 
to embrace challenges as opportunities for growth, to embark on a journey of self-discovery, to welcome change with open arms, and to take consistent, purposeful action towards our goals. Remember, the journey does not end here. Transformation is an ongoing process, a continuous journey of growth and evolution. As you step forward from this moment, carry with you the lessons we've shared, the insights you've gained, and the resolve to continue growing, learning, and evolving. I encourage you to take a moment to envision your future, the life you dream of creating. See it in vivid detail, the achievements, the joy, the fulfillment. Hold on to that vision guide you, and let it guide forward. you as you move forward. Let it be the beacon, let it be the that, beacon lights your path, that lights your path, the compass, path, the that, compass directs your that directs your journey. As you embark on as you this path, path, remember that, you are, remember that you are not alone. The journey of transformation, journey of transformation is a road, many, is a road have many have traveled many before, before and many will travel after. after. Seek out mentors, Seek out mentors surround, yourself surround yourself with like-minded like individuals, individuals and never be afraid to ask for help or guidance. Together we are stronger and together we can achieve more. In closing, in closing, I want to I leave, leave you with a thought, with a thought to, carry to carry in your hearts. In your hearts. You, have you have in you, in you all, all the strength, strength wisdom, and determination you need to transform your life. The power to change, to grow, to achieve your greatest dreams lies with embrace it, nurture it, and, and let, let it shine. As you, As you step, step out into the world, remember, remember that, that every day is a new opportunity, opportunity. A, blank a blank canvas, canvas waiting, waiting for you to you paint, paint your masterpiece. Your masterpiece. Approach, Approach each day, day with enthusiasm, with passion, with passion and with the unshakable belief, belief you are capable, you are capable of, extraordinary of extraordinary Especially for me, farm boy from Idaho. I didn't have many skills when I first uh, awakened to the opportunity that, you know, you could work for pay. I knew how to milk cows, but you know, that was about it and it didn't pay very well. But when I was introduced to network marketing, health and nutrition, a marketing system where I could start at the bottom, go to the top and start part time, it literally revolutionized and changed my life forever. I've never been the same. And a big share of my story now is sharing with people around the world this extraordinary opportunity. And then along with it, the philosophy that makes it work. Because you can have every technique in the world and the best product in the world, and you can have the finest support system in the world, but unless you have the philosophy that drives you to do the necessary things to make it work, then nothing works. So I like to talk about all the things that made it work for me and see if that might not be valuable for uh, someone else. So I want you to take some good notes. If you're ready to take notes, say, I'm ready. I like this crowd already. Treat me well, I might take you with me as my traveling audience. <laughs> now, here's the next key on being prepared for the next century, and that is your personal philosophy. At age 25, the things that so dramatically changed my life was, number one, the discovery of a unique product that I could believe in. My, my mother taught nutrition, and she taught good health, so I was the beneficiary of that. It came from my grandmother, my grandfather, passed it on to my mother. She taught it, passed it on to me. Uh, my father never had a major illness, lived to be 93. My mother extended her life, according to the doctor, at least 20 years. She should have died at least 20 years earlier than she did, simply because she stretched out those years by the study of good nutrition. I was an only child, and Mama studied and, you know, mixed up all that stuff back then. You know, she'd say, hey, me and Papa and her, she said, drink this stuff. If it don't kill us, I think it'll help, you know, and we're... <laughs> Dagging down this stuff. And Mama taught all of that. But the payoff was so incredible. I passed it on to my two daughters. They've never been ill. They passed it on to their children, my grandchildren. They haven't been ill. I mean, the study of good nutrition, paying attention, and being involved in the industry you're in, it's one of the best. So, that's so important. Your personal philosophy, what you believe in, that's going to carry you into the next century. Let me give you now some of the early philosophies that changed my life forever. I heard one of them in my introduction. Some of these philosophies have lived with me now all of these years. I've passed them on and people have come back around saying, Mr. Rohn, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, I sat in your class and sat in your seminar and those early things that you taught, I have practiced it and I'm doing it. A man not long ago showed me notes he took 23 years ago. And then he had me sign those notes. He said, I've used these notes to develop my life, my personal life, and my business life. And when he took those notes, he said, I was 18 years old. So it's incredible. 
I'm so thankful for all these years. But now I want to pass it along to you. Some of the philosophies that changed my life forever. Okay, if you're ready, say I'm ready. ready. Here's the first one. Profits are better than wages. Once I understood that, I got rich. Profits are better than wages. Nobody taught me that in high school. I went to college for a year and a half and I never heard it. I'm 25 and broke. I'm not destitute. I'm broke. Too much month at the end of the money is broke. And I finally hear this philosophy. Profits are better than wages. Now, here's the phrase that goes with it. Wages make you a living, which is fine. Profits make you a fortune, which is super fine. And you can live both fine and super fine. You've now got the mechanism and the ways and means to do that. Profits are better than wages. Guess what? I taught this in Moscow when I was teaching capitalism. You know, the communists had it all wrong. They taught that capitalism was, you know, a big company that oppresses its workers. I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. They had mentally lost it when they came up with this ridiculous philosophy. Uh, communism taught capital belongs to the state, not the people. And we taught all these years what? Capital belongs in the hands of the people, not the state. That's why, of course, kids should pay taxes, because they can be capitalists, and all capitalists should pay taxes. And it doesn't take much to start an enterprise that makes a profit. I teach kids how to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. I mean, you know, how long does it take? How long does it take to make a profit? I mean, a little ingenuity and you're on your way. So profits are better than wages. Capitalism better than communism. Communism said people are too dumb and stupid to know what to do with capital. So you must take capital away from all the dumb, stupid people and give it to the all-wise, all-knowing state. And let the state run everything. I mean, that was communism. And they devastated every country they touched. I've been to East Germany. It's taking a trillion dollars just to clean up East Germany. They've already spent 500 billion. They got 500 billion more to go. I mean, every country they touched, and I've been in all of them, they devastated them all with their devastating philosophy. We teach capital belongs in the hands of the people. That's where the ingenuity is to bring goods and services to the marketplace. And I'm going to show you later the miracle of capitalism grassroots in America, which you're involved in. But once I understood this now, it was so incredible. Profits are better than wages. Now, when I first was recruited, I'm a distributor for this little product called Abunda Vida. And here's what my mentor said, Mr. Schof. He said, Mr. Owen, you can start this miracle working business part-time. You don't have to go full-time. You can start part-time. And he said, if you'll devote to start with, let's say, 10, 12, 15 hours a week, where you'll start making a profit, here's what you can now say. I'm working full-time on my job and part-time on my fortune. Because profits lead to fortune. I got so excited about that philosophy. I'm working full-time on my job, but now I'm working part-time on my fortune. I found a way not only to make a living, you won't believe this, I found a way to make a fortune. <laughs> Can you imagine what that's like then to get up in the morning? To go to work on your fortune? Not to go to work to pay the rent, which is okay, but a chance to go to work to make a fortune? And I said, right now I'm working part-time on my fortune and full-time on my job, but it won't be long until I'll be working full-time on my fortune. Can you imagine what life is going to be like? <laughs> now, here was my first goal when I started, and that was part-time I wanted to equal on my profits part-time what I was earning on my full-time job. This is called the magic of part-time. It is so thrilling for people to start working the business part-time because now you can work on profits and it doesn't take very long if you'll really concentrate on those 10 12 15 hours a week it won't be long if you really do it right and learn some of the skills I'm going to talk about it won't be long until you can be earning as much part-time working on your fortune as you are full-time working on your job I did that in less than six months now I've got an incredible invitation 
I found a way part-time to work on my fortune, and I'm making as much money at that as I am on my full-time job. Would you like to hear my story? It was incredible. Now, here was my second goal, to make twice as much money part-time working on my fortune as I was working full-time on my job. And I reached that in less than a year. Making twice as much money part-time working on my fortune as I was full-time working on my job. Now I've got an incredible invitation that won't quit. I found a way through a unique opportunity to work part-time on my fortune and I'm now earning twice as much money as I am working full-time on my job. Would you like to hear my story? Do you imagine anybody would say, no, I don't care to hear your story? No. Everybody I said that to said, wow, yes, what are you doing? I said, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. Now, when I started making twice as much money part-time as full-time, here's, here's my dilemma. I didn't want to go full-time. And why not go full-time? And the reason was because I didn't want to give up my electrifying story. <laughs> right? It was so powerful, nobody could resist the invitation to at least take a look. I didn't want to give it up. And I hung on for I don't know how long until it was, you know, almost insane. And then finally, finally, reluctantly, I gave up my full-time job. But now, but now you can imagine the thrill and excitement of going to work full-time on my fortune. It was incredible. But I want you to jot down the magic of part-time. What does it take to really change a person's lifestyle? Not very much. An extra thousand a month, I'm telling you, will drastically change most American families' lifestyle. And that's why part-time is so valuable, because it very quickly changes a person's lifestyle. And here's what the change in lifestyle does. It's a great recruiting tool. One of the greatest recruiting attractions is the money you make part-time. Somebody said, you've been on three vacations this year? Says, yes, I got this little part-time thing going. Says, what's that? <laughs> you bought two new cars, one for you and one for her? How did you do that? Said, I got this little part-time thing going. You, your kids have got all these new clothes? Yes. All this stuff is happening? What is it? An extra thousand a month. See, a thousand a month full-time, nobody wants to hear your story. A thousand a month part-time, it starts to change your lifestyle, everybody wants to hear your story. So the key is part-time. The magic and the attraction of part-time gives you a classic invitation for somebody to listen to what you're doing that's changing your life. And it's not just necessarily the money that changes your life. It's what you do with the money. It's the change of lifestyle. So part-time helps to change lifestyle, which gives you a classic invitation to look at what you're doing. That's how I started in network marketing, age 25. Wow, these philosophies changed my life. I wish I would have learned them in high school. In high school, if they would have offered wealth one, wealth two, I'd have taken both classes. I wouldn't have waited until I was 25 and broke. Here's the next one. Philosophy that helped change my life. It's not what happens that determines your life future. It's not what happens that determines your life future. It's what you do about what happens. All of us are in like a little sailboat. And it's not the blowing of the wind that determines your destination. It's the set of the sail. So jot this phrase down. It's one of the best to understand. Kids need to understand it. The same wind blows on us all. The same wind blows on us all. The wind of disaster, the wind of opportunity, the wind of change. The wind when it's upside down, the wind when it's favorable and unfavorable. The same wind blows on us all. The economic wind, the social wind, the political wind. The same wind blows on everybody. The difference in where you arrive in one year, three years, five years, the difference in arrival is not the blowing of the wind, but the set of the sail. And that's what learning is all about, to set a better sail this year than last year, 
to set a better sail. The first six years of my economic life, I wound up broke. Second six years, I wound up rich. You say, well, the Democrats must have finally gotten power. No, no, no. It was not a political change. Here's what changed the second six years of my economic life. It was my philosophy that changed. The set of the sale of better thinking, correcting the errors of the past and picking up new disciplines for the future. That's all I had to do at the end of the first six. Correct the errors of the past and then pick up some new disciplines for the future. And my total life changed. The second six years was totally different than the first six of my working life. And guess who can do that? Anybody. Now, you can keep on the same path for the next couple of years as you have the past two. But if you wish to, if you wish to, and maybe everything's okay for you and you don't need to, but if you need to make some changes, I'm telling you, you can start doing it today so that the next two years will be drastically different than the last two. And anybody who wishes to do that can. And you can do it between ages 40 and 43. You can do it between ages 13 and 50. You can do it between ages 60 and 62. Any two years, any five years that you wish to drastically change from the previous five, you can do it. If you wish to. Now, this, is not, this, is, this isn't written. This is not a law. Here's what it's called, opportunity. But if you don't know you can change, if you don't know you can drastically change your income, change your future, change your health, change your marriage, change everything, if you don't know that, some people then go year after year after year after year not making much change simply because they, they didn't get to the class. They never read the book. They never went to the seminar. They never made the discovery. They didn't seek for the knowledge of how could I make my life better. And if you just rock along, I'm telling you it's okay. Anybody can live any way they choose, but I'm here to tell all of you that if you wish to, it's possible to make the next three years totally different than the last three. And all you have to do is just a few things. So if you got that one now, it's not the blowing of the wind that determines your income. It's not the blowing of the wind that determines your fortune. It's the set of the safe. And that's why we gathered here today. Maybe I've got some ideas that'll help you with a couple of little things about setting the sail of your thinking that might drastically give you multiplied more benefit the next three years than you've gotten in the last three. So it's not what happens. What happens happens to everybody. Chevron years ago brought me in to talk to management. They said, Mr. Owen, you travel around the world and you're fairly knowledgeable. What do you think the next 10 years are going to be like? I said, gentlemen, I can tell you, I do know the right people. So they all leaned forward and listened carefully. And I said, gentlemen, the next 10 years are going to be about like the last 10. <laughs> the next season after fall is, well, I promise you that's not going to change. After day comes, night, I promise you that's not going to change. Here's how the last 6,000 years reads. If you want to make a note of Jim Rohn's vision of history, the last 6,000 years, here's how it reads. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. And if we're around another 6,000 years, it's going to read like that looks like for the next 6,000 years. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. Now, sometimes there seems to be more opportunity than difficulty, and then sometimes there seems to be more difficulty than opportunity, but the mix isn't going to change. After expansion comes recession. But after recession comes expansion. Not to think so, see, is naive. And once you've got just a little of this stuff settled, then you know exactly what to do. You know exactly what to anticipate so you can be ready. Now, here's the next one, and I heard it in my invitation. Here's what it says. For things to change, you have to change. I was hoping the government would change and taxes would change and economics would change and my boss would change and be more generous. I wished for everything to change. And my teacher said, no, Mr. Owen, for things to change for you, you have to change. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Once I understood this, this altered the course of my life. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. And here's the big one. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. You don't need less problems. You simply need more skills. Don't wish for less challenge. Wish for more wisdom. Accept the challenge because you can't grow without a challenge. 
You can't get rich without a challenge. You can't fly without gravity. You have to understand the challenge. But that's the key, is to now develop wisdom to overcome the challenge. Don't wish for less challenge, but more wisdom. And then here's one more philosophy to help change my life forever. You can do the most remarkable things no matter what happens. Humans can do the most remarkable things no matter what happens. Philosophies that change my life. Here's one of the big philosophies I learned in network marketing. It's called the law of averages. If you do something often enough, a ratio will appear. Key phrase, if you do something often enough, a ratio will appear. It's amazing. It's uncanny. In baseball, we call it batting average. If you talk to 10 people, one says yes. Now the ratio has begun. One out of 10. Talk to 10, get one. Here's something interesting about the law of averages. Once it starts, it tends to continue. This is colossal information. Once a ratio starts, it tends to continue. If you talk to 10 and get one, sure enough, chances are excellent. If you talk to 10 more, you'll get another one. Talk to 10 more, you'll get another one. Now you can compete. If you can only get one out of 10, you can compete, even with somebody that can get nine out of 10. If you've been here a long time, you can get nine out of 10. I just joined, I can only get one out of 10. If we have a 30-day contest, I will beat you. you. Say, well, how could you beat me? Here's why. During that 30 days, you talk to 10 and get nine, I talk to 100 and get 10. I beat you. <laughs> Isn't that clever? This is clever stuff. And I do it for two reasons. I sincerely wish to win. But I do it for another very sincere reason. I wish for you to lose. <laughs> and that's noble on my part. Here's why it's noble. You learn more by losing than you do by winning. So I wish to give you that experience. <laughs> now here's how I do it once I understand uh, the law of averages. When I'm new, I make up in numbers what I lack in skill. I make up in numbers what I lack in skill. Now, who can do that? Anybody that's ambitious. Anybody with a little ingenuity. Anybody. Doesn't matter. Now, here's one more. The law of averages can be increased. You get one out of 10, talk to 10, get another one. Talk to 10, get another one. The fourth time you talk to 10, you get two. Why would the fourth time you talk to 10, you get two instead of one? You're getting better. You're getting better. And who can get better? Anybody. Talk to 10, get two. Talk to 10, get two. Finally, talk to 10, get three. I finally got up to about three. Now, it takes more than a genius to go past like three or four. But three will do. If you bat 300 in baseball, they pay you $4 million a year, which means you're out seven times out of 10. Seven times out of 10, out. Make $4 million a year. Are you ready for that? So this works so well now in your business. Just jot the phrase down. You don't have to bat a thousand. You don't have to bat a thousand to make big money. One out of ten is fine. Two out of ten is terrific. Three out of ten is fabulous. Some particular incredible genius might get four out of ten. But three out of ten is sufficient to make you rich beyond your wildest imagination. This is how I went after my friends, neighbors, and relatives when I first started recruiting. I said, look, I've got a new business, and I'm getting about three out of ten to join. And I don't mind you. Just come to the meeting and be one of the seven. Right? Doesn't matter. Right? You're my friend, you'll do me a favor. And so it's not important to me that you like it. It's not important to me that you join. It's certainly not important to me that you buy. It's just important to me that you listen. One of the reasons though I want you to hear the story is because a year from now, if I'm doing well, I don't want you to say, how come you never picked up the phone a year ago? I never got a letter, never got a call. You call me a friend? You're making all this money, you never picked up the phone. So I don't want that to happen. 
So for two reasons, I want you to see what I'm doing. So the year from now, if I'm doing well, I can say, you know, I gave you the opportunity. But also, just as a favor, come and be one of the seven. It doesn't matter to me if you buy or join. But I need ten to get three. And if you're one of the three, wonderful. If you're not, wonderful. It, it doesn't. It might matter to you. It might matter to you, but it doesn't matter to me. Now, it matters to me because we're friends, but it doesn't matter in terms of my averages. So if you decide to get rich, just learn the law of averages. You're off and running. Now, here's the second law that changed my life forever in network marketing. I learned the law of sowing and reaping. And in the law of sowing and reaping is also the story of the law of averages. Jot this down. The story of the sower comes from the Bible. I'm an amateur on the Bible, but this is such a useful story. Here's what the story says. And take the notes because the drama's in the details. The sower was ambitious. Evidently, he was ambitious. When you read the whole story, you'll conclude, yes, this was an ambitious sower. Here was number two. He had excellent seed. The sower who sowed the seed had excellent seed. And the excellent seed can be an excellent opportunity, an excellent product, an excellent story. So we've got an ambitious sower with excellent seed. But now here's the rest of the details of the story for your information, for the drama of your life, so you can understand things better. Learning some of this is how I got rich by age 31. Okay. Number one, it says the sower goes out to sow the seed, but the first part of the seed falls by the wayside and the birds get it. So jot this down. The birds are going to get some of the seed. The birds are going to get some of the seed. Now you say, well, Mr. Owen, what does that mean? Well, I invite John to come to a meeting. He said he'd be there Tuesday night. Tuesday night I show up, John isn't there. I say, John, I wonder why John didn't make it. Now I know the answer. The birds. <laughs> the birds. John had this great idea of coming to the meeting to look at an opportunity, and somebody stole it and said, you're not going to go see network marketing and he says well maybe not so have you jotted that down now the birds are going to get some now when the birds get some you've got two options number one is to chase birds <laughs> and say well let me get a hold of the person that talked to him how to come to the meeting i'll tear him a new page but <laughs> i wouldn't do this Here's what happens if you go chasing birds. You leave the field. If you go chasing birds now, you leave the field, which is going to distract from your future, not add. So you can't chase birds and try to straighten this stuff out. Here's what it is. It's just one of those things. And here's the best comment when things are a little disappointing. Isn't that interesting? You just, you just have to say, I thought, sure, he would be there. He promised me. He promised me, but I know it was the birds. And you just have to say, isn't that interesting? Now, here's the rest of the story. It says, the sower kept on sowing. See, that was the secret to his success. He kept on sowing. And if you keep sowing, you can sow more than the birds can get because there aren't enough birds. If you keep sowing, there are some birds, but there's not enough because the law of averages will work for you. My mentor taught me, he said, you know, Mr. Owen, there's only nine or ten real nasty, miserable people in the whole world. Now, he says they move around a lot, you know, and you're liable to... <laughs> You'll bump into one once in a while. But when you bump into one, you say, there's only nine more like you. I can handle that in the whole world. Okay. Now, here's what else it says. The sower now keeps sowing the seed. Now the seed falls, the story says on rocky ground where the soil is shallow. And the rocky ground where the soil is shallow is not of your making because you had excellent seed and you were an ambitious sower. So the rocky ground where the soil is shallow is not of your making. But here's what it says what happened. This time, the little seed that falls in the ground starts to grow and the little plant starts to grow. But the first hot day, it withers and dies. It does. Not an easy thing to watch. I finally get John started. Sure enough, three or four days later, somebody says, boo, 
and he goes. <laughs> He's gone. Doesn't show up at the second meeting. And I say, I thought, sure, John would last a week. What happened? Jot this down. The hot weather is going to get some. And this is not of your making. Here's what you must say when that happens. Isn't that interesting? Wow. What can you do? The answer is nothing. You say, well, I'm going to try to change this. I wouldn't take that class. You know, the sun comes up in the east. Somebody says, why is that? I wouldn't spend much time on that. Just let that happen. Don't go for this why, why, why stuff. I'm giving you the answers here. The answers is in the structure and the consequences and in the deal. The answer is in the deal. Anything beyond that is not worth study. You say, well, how come some just last a little while? I wouldn't sign up for that class. Here's the answer. Some don't stay. You just, you just have to jot that down. And when some leaves, you say, that's one of those that don't stay. You just... You, now you know what category to put them in. And you can't solve this now. You can't, it's like rearranging the seasons. You can't fool with that. All you can do is cooperate with the way things are set up. I didn't set it up. You say, well, it shouldn't be this way. Well, when you get your own planet, you can rearrange this whole deal. <laughs> but on this planet, you're a guest. You've got to take it as it comes. Now, here was the secret to the ambitious sower with good seed. It said he kept on Sowing. Now, here's what he had to do to keep on sowing. He had to discipline his disappointment. This is a key phrase now to use the rest of your life. You must learn to discipline your disappointment because you didn't set up the setup and some are not going to stay and that is not of your making. Now, if you made gross errors and you ran them off, see, that'd be different. Now, you're responsible for that. But if it's in the normal course of things, this is the way things are. Now, here's what it says. The sower keeps on sowing. Now it says the seed falls on thorny ground. And somebody says, well, how much of this do you have to go through? Well, hang on, it's, it's not the end of the story now. Now the little seed falls on thorny ground, and now the little plant starts to grow again. But as the little plant starts to grow, the thorns choke it to death, and it dies. So jot this down. The thorns are going to get some. And that's not of your making. And what are these thorns? The story even called these little thorns, little cares, little distractions, little somethings. Who knows what all they are? I say, John, we had a meeting last night. You weren't here. John says, well, I can't make every meeting. I say, why not? You're part time. He said, well, the screen door came off the hinges. And you just can't let your house fall apart. You've got to take some time and fix things up. And I can hear the thorns going, uh-uh. He says some extra trash had piled up in the garage. You can't let mountains of trash take over. You got to keep your trash hauled out. <laughs> People who let little things cheat them out of big opportunities. People who let little things cheat them out of big opportunities. And you feel almost helpless. What could I do about that? And that's nothing. And you say, well, why is this? I'm asking you not to sign up for that class. Don't sign up for these why is this class. It's just the way it is. Like winter following fall and spring following winter. So if you got that, the thorns are going to get some. But now here's the good news. Let's read the rest of the story now quickly. The sower now what? Keeps on sowing the seed. Keeps on sharing the story. Keeps on giving an invitation. Yes, the invitation can be more powerful for me as it was one year later than it was the first, the first month. Because now I'm saying I'm making twice as much money part-time as I'm making on my full-time job. Yes, the story can be more powerful, but the law of average is still going to work. But now here's what the story said. Finally, the seed falls on good ground. Finally, the seed falls on good ground. Now put this in parenthesis. It always will. If you keep sowing. If you share a good idea long enough, it will fall on good people. But now here's the rest of that story. Some of the good ground did 30%. And some of the good ground did 
60%. And some of the good ground did 100%. You say, well, why the difference in numbers? I wouldn't sign up for that class. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Have I said that often enough now? <laughs> Don't register for that class. It's just the way it is. Now, I tried to get the 30s to do 60. Found out it was more than I could handle. I used to say, I'll make them successful if it kills me. I almost died. <laughs> no, you can't do that. Here's what you do. Let the 30s do 30 to the best of their ability and keep doing 30 because that's how they build their lifestyle and get what they want out of life. And let the 60s do 60, and let the 100s do 100s. Now, how can you get some to do 100%? You got to go through all these experiences, and you got to talk to all these people. Let me quickly give you now a list of the skills that changed my life forever. Developing a new philosophy that I could do it. In my network marketing experience now led me to developing new skills. Right, I knew how to milk cows, but it didn't pay well. Here's the first skill I learned to change my life. Getting a customer. Making a sale. And of course, sales for you is easy, right? Because it's not technical. Right? The technical is all taken care of. You simply represent your product. If you share a unique product, talk about its merits, persuade someone that it's the best, they agree to buy, that's the simple art of sales. But in your business, here's what it's more like, sharing. Because using the product yourself, gathering some testimonials, you simply share that. So we're not talking like high-powered spacecraft technical skills here. It's simply sharing something you've discovered with someone else and doing it well enough to where they agree they would like to participate. Now here's what happened when I learned sales. It multiplied my income by five. Now, it didn't take that much because I wasn't doing that well in farm country, but it did multiply my income by five. Sales, getting customers, laying that incredible foundation for an entrepreneurial career. So now I've got two skills, milking cows and making sales. Here's the next one I learned that changed me forever, and that's recruiting, introducing the business opportunity to new people learning how to give a good invitation, learning how to give two kinds of presentation, formal and informal. And the third part of recruiting, of course, is following up. Once you start a new life, now you've got to take care of it, like a new mother would take care of her baby. You don't start a new life and abandon it. You start a new life and nourish it like a mother and protect it like a father. You've got to be mo both mother and father to a new person. Nourishment, ideas like a mother. Protection. Help defend your new life against the encroachment of outside voices that would try to talk them out of it. So you've got to be mother and father in this art of recruiting. We call it being a sponsor. And being a sponsor is like being a bridge, helping somebody from darkness to light, from skeptic to faith, from not knowing to knowing, from no confidence in themselves to starting to gain confidence. You're the bridge that helps people from the shadows to the sunlight. It's one of the most exciting positions to occupy in all of network marketing industry is the bridge, helping people crossing the bridge out from discouragement into recognition. Being this bridge, that's what the recruiting magic is all about. You've got the answers. They've been looking for the answers. You've got the answers, and you help them cross this bridge. You see something in them before they can see it in themselves. You assure them that it's possible to be more than they are Therefore, they can earn more than they've got, have more than they possess. This is one of the great arts in the world. And here's what's exciting about this art. It pays big money. Because now you operate a unique philosophy taught first in the Bible. John Kennedy taught it in his inaugural speech. Zig Ziglar's got one of the best ways to put it. And that's the secret to wealth. The secret to wealth and fortune. First taught in the Bible. Because the question was asked, how can we achieve greatness, great wealth, great power, great influence, great recognition, great self-esteem? How can we achieve greatness? The master teacher was asked, 
And here was his formula for achieving personal greatness. He said, find a way to serve the many, for service to many leads to greatness. For those that are interested. Some people aren't interested, but for those that are, service to many leads to greatness. Someone says, well, best I can do is just take care of myself, which is okay, but it doesn't lead to greatness. Somebody says, I got enough bills of my own, I can't worry about someone else's bills. That's okay, but it doesn't lead to greatness. Greatness is helping people pay their bills, you forget about yours. Because if you help enough people pay theirs, yours disappear. Help people with problems, your problems disappear. The key to greatness, the master teacher taught, is finding a way. Now, a lot of people would like to serve many people, but they don't have a way. And what's exciting about you and your business is you've now got the way. Whether you use it or not, it's up to you. Whether you cash it in or not, it's up to you. Whether you make a fortune or just a little, that's all up to you. Each person's ambition, it's called the same marketing, the same product. The products are the same for everybody here. The marketing system is the same. The difference is each person's philosophy and each person's individual ambition. But whatever your ambitions are, now you've got the ways and means. And here's what you've got the ways and means to do. Serve as many people as you would like. Now, here's what's exciting about recruiting. With what you're involved in here, you can directly and indirectly affect the lives of dozens of people. Some of you are going to directly and indirectly affect the lives of hundreds of people. And some of you, if you wish, can directly and indirectly affect the lives of thousands of people. And the pay is accordingly. If you affect a few you earn that pay. If you affect the many, you earn that pay. But the secret is found in the Bible. Service to many leads to greatness. Now, John Kennedy said it in his inaugural speech. Here's what he said. Don't ask. Don't we wish that was the current political philosophy? Where is John Kennedy and his philosophy? John Kennedy said, don't ask. That's important if you understand philosophy. He said, don't ask what the people can do for you. Don't ask what the country can do for you. Don't ask what the government can do for you. That's not how you get rich. That's not how you have high self-esteem. That's not how you get trophies to put on the mantle above the fireplace, asking what the people can do for you. Don't ask, he said, what the people can do for you. But ask, what could I do for my country? And the country means the people. What could I do for the people? I want trophies. I want recognition. I want high self-esteem. I would even like, like a chance to make a fortune. John Kennedy says it's easy. Don't ask what the people can do for you, but ask, what could I do for the people? Could I directly and indirectly serve many in my country? And now that you are participating in this program, the answer is yes. Now, Zig probably said it best. Zig's got some great stuff. Zig and I have been good friends for a lot of years. Zig says, money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. <laughs> Zig, you're right. Zig says, my dentist told me, Zig, only floss the teeth you want to keep. You know, forget the rest. But here, Zig is famous for this now. This is one of Zig's philosophies, and it goes right along with the other two, the Bible and John Kennedy. Here's what Zig says. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Now, wanting everything you want, we call that self-interest. But it's, it, it's okay to have self-interest if you do it in a positive way. By helping enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Now, you can accomplish all that by learning this next skill called recruiting. And I learned it, and it made me fortunes. So now I've got three skills, milking cows, making sales, and recruiting. Here's the next skill I learned that paid big money, organizing. Once you got a few, get them to work together, see, and that's magic. Getting people to work together is magic. Now, yes, it's challenging, like having some, you know, several in members of your family getting them to work together is challenging, but it's magic. Getting husband and wife to work together is challenging, but it's magic when it happens. But everything magic is challenging. Just got to jot that down. Everything magic is challenging. But once you figure out the challenge and go for it, then the magic occurs. Let me tell you how, magic, how magical people working together is. Let me quote the Bible again. 
It says, if two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing is impossible. Just try that on for your mental size. If two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing's impossible. Everybody's looking for a challenge. Here's what I teach, especially the kids. Here's the best challenge in the world. Let's go do it. Not you go do it. Let's go do it. If two or three of us decide on a common purpose to do it, nothing's impossible. Incredible. Working together, organizing. Now, when everybody's an independent, now it's a little more challenging. Like having kids, they've each got their own opinions. They've each got their own uh, ambitions and desires. It, it's, it's challenging. You've got a variety. But that's what makes life the variety. And it is, in your business, it is challenging, getting people to work together. It's like herding cats. You know, sheep are easy, sheep are easy, but you've got to try cats, herding cats. <laughs> but if you can possibly get it done, the power is so immense when you get people to work together. Here's one of the powers of working together, shared testimonials. If I've got somebody new and you're there and I'm there, I give them my testimonial, you give your testimonial. Maybe what tips the scales in getting me a new person is not my testimonial, but my partner's testimonial, somebody I'm working with. Their testimonial got them. Shared testimonials are so powerful. That's why getting working together is okay, is powerful. Now, working by yourself is okay. All this stuff is okay. Everybody needs to know, though, where are the advantages? And these are some of the advantages. I learned to organize, paid big money. Here's what I next learned to do. Promote. Promotion now pays staggering money. Now, the company comes up with what we call major promotions. Here's what you've got to come up with. The smaller promotions. The company comes up with major recognition. You've got to come up with small recognition for your people around you. The top five. The company's got top five. You've got your own top five in maybe two or three categories. Top five, top five, top five. And those little recognitions. To reach certain levels in the company, you have to take major steps. But for you, recognition, let them take small steps. Here's one of the secrets of your kind of business. Rewarding people for small steps of progress. Rewarding people. Sometimes it's just recognition, handshake, pat on the back. Mary, you're doing a fabulous job. And you figure out what those recognitions are. Small steps of progress. Guess what promotion pays if you learn it well? Big money. Getting people to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do by themselves. People will do some unique things by themselves, but if you can figure out a way to say, Mary, if you do this and this, she says, well, I'll go for it. Now, she, she wouldn't have thought of that on her own. Here's what works magic. It's better than money. Money's a bit unimportant. Here's what's important. Ingenuity. The best place to wake up your ingenuity is what you're doing right now. Representing a unique product and getting customers, recruiting distributors, and promoting and all this stuff. Ingenuity. Figuring out a way. If it doesn't work this way, we'll work another way. I used my ingenuity, made a fortune. My ingenuity worked on doing all these campaigns, the spring campaign and the summer campaign and the winter campaign. This week we're going to recruit school teachers. How many of you got? How many of you got? School, this is school teacher week, school teacher month. I'd pick out a little category and say, let's go for it. And it doesn't matter what it is, just dream up something so that somebody's got a little more objective to go for than just their own. Key phrase. We all need to belong to something bigger than ourselves. Because we furnish inspiration for what's bigger, and the bigger furnishes inspiration for us. I learned promotion and it paid big money. Here's next I learned. Communication. How to conduct a meeting. I learned identification, logic and reason. Attack and confess. Solution. Simple deals on communication. Wasn't easy for me at first. I stood up to give my first presentation, my mind sat back down. <laughs> right? Y'all been through that? Opened my mouth, nothing came out for a while. But here's what I did. I did it again. Just jot that phrase down. I did it again. That's the secret to how I got here. 35, 40 years later, it's how I got here. I did it once, it was uncomfortable. That first presentation was so lousy, if I hadn't have been doing it, I'd have gone home. <laughs> it was not that good. But here's the secret to how I got here. I did it again, and then I did it again, and then I did it again, and I did it again. I remember when I first decided to be a little more animated, right? 
and walk out away from the podium, right? Get out from just behind the podium. So I got out there, and then I thought, how do you get back? <laughs> Whoa, I'm stranded out here. Remember those times, doing something for the first time? But you learn quickly in your business, right? In your business, a guy stands up to give his first testimonial, and he's so nervous he forgets his own name, right? And 30 days later, he wants to give a three-hour testimonial, right? You hardly get him off the stage. So, learn communication. How to affect other people with words. That's the greatest art in the world to learn. How to affect other people with words. Key phrase, don't be lazy in language. If you learn to use the gift of your own language wisely, it can make you a fortune and build an incredible life. Here's three other things I learned. One is to train. Training people how the business works. And then I've used another word called teach. Train and teach. And only to say this, training people how the business works, teaching is how life works. Because here's what all of us need for the 21st century, business skills and life skills. The life skills are leadership skills. The life skills are learning how to set goals. Now, here's the ultimate skill to learn that can transform your life and the life of whoever will listen, the ability to inspire. Inspire means help people to look up a little higher than where they are and wish they could get there and inspire them that it's possible. Here's how we inspire, by our own testimony. If I can do it, you can do it. Here's how else we inspire, by others' testimonial. If they can do it, Mary, you can do it. Getting people to see themselves better than they are. Getting people to see themselves richer than they are. Getting people to see themselves more capable next year than they are this year. Getting to see themselves in the future. To help both your kids and your people, here's what you must learn to do. Number one, help people to see themselves as they are. If people have made mistakes, they've got to know it. You can't go on making mistakes and hope to achieve. Mistakes have to be corrected. And you've got to do it with your children, help them to see themselves as they are. If they've messed up, here's what you've got to say. You've messed up. But here's what's important as a parent. Don't leave them in the mess. Some parents, you know, tell their kids they've messed up and then they leave them in the mess. They don't paint a better picture. Here's what you could become with just a couple of more changes. Rather than this, here's what you could be. So we must help our children see themselves as they are, but here's the greatest gift, to help our children see themselves better than they are. To transport them not only past to see their mistakes, but transport them to the future to see their opportunity. To see the person they can become. My mentor had that greatest gift to help me to see myself better than I was. At first, it was difficult to see. And then I started to believe, and that's how I got here today. He said, one of these days, Mr. Owen, you'll walk into a room full of people, and you will hear some of them say, that's him. That's the famous man. I, I said, well, that could never happen to me. He said, trust me. If you keep working hard on the disciplines like you're doing right now, that'll happen. You'll walk into a room full of people, and you'll hear one say, that's him. That's the famous man. He saw it, and he tried to get me to see it. And now, finally, it's happened. I think when I walked in here today, I think I heard someone say, that's him, that's the famous man. <laughs> it happened for me. And if it can happen for me, it can happen for you. Just master these skills to inspire. Here's what else I, I learned, the skills of building an organization. Learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. You must be like life itself. Respond to deserve, not to need. It doesn't say if you need, you will have a harvest. It doesn't say if you need a harvest, you'll have a harvest. It's not what it says. It says if you plant, chances are good you'll have a harvest. If you plant, you will reap. Not if you need, you will reap. So we must be like life itself. Respond to the people who deserve it by planting, by taking the first step. Even God himself says, if you move toward me, I'll move toward you. That's the condition. You move toward me, I'll move toward you, says the Almighty. Now, he could also say, you don't move, I don't move. You say, well, that's arbitrary. Well, when you're God, you can set it up that way. Now, learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. Now, here's what's the next step. Teach people how to deserve your time. Teach people how to deserve your attention. Teach people how to deserve a phone call. 
Say, Mary, you just take this one step and I take two steps. You take two steps, I take five steps. You don't step, I don't step. But this isn't hard now. You step, I step. You respond, I respond. You try, I try. You make a call, I back you up. Right? Learn to teach people how to deserve your time and your attention. Next. I learn to work by group more than individual. Here's why. 80% of the people do 20% of the business. So 20% of the people you can work with individual. 80% you have to work with by group. But group is very powerful, less confrontational. Then here's what's important for all of you to learn as a sponsor, helping other people. You can help a thousand, but you can't carry three on your back. You can help a thousand, but you can't carry three on your back. And I'm sure all of you have already gotten that experience, even though you've been here a short time. Some people will try to get on your back. That's where we got that expression, get off. That's where we got that. A guy discovered somebody on his back and said, what? I can't carry you, get. Now... If you're like some I see here, you know, six foot four and you weigh 300 pounds, you might carry one, and if, if you were really big enough, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or something, you might carry two, but you can't carry three. When babies are born, they were not designed just to be carried. Babies were not born to be carried all their life. Someday you've got to try your legs. Someday you got to try your wings. Someday you got to try. Even if you fall down, you got to try because you can't just crawl around all your life. You can't be carried all your life. So as quickly as possible, you can help a thousand, but you can't carry three. Next, don't expect the pear tree to bear apples. I used to try to change everything. You can hang apples on a pear tree. I'm telling you, it won't help. You can put up a sign, this is an apple tree. Sure enough, come the season, pears. Here's what I learned. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. Incredible. Capital in your business isn't what matters. Okay, it's not the money that buys you a future. It's your skills that buy you a future. Money and no skills, and I'm telling you, you're still poor. Money and no ambition, where are you? Money and no courage, you're broke. A little bit of money and a whole lot of courage, that's all we need. I'm looking for people when I'm recruiting back in those days, and the money didn't matter. What mattered to me was somebody's willingness, somebody's ingenuity, somebody's willingness to try, right? If they had a dollar to invest, that was plenty for me. A dollar and some ambition. And I can show you how to get rich. And it'll be one of the classic stories of the company. I go to recruit somebody. They say, I don't have any money. See, I've been looking for you for six months. <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you how to do it without any money. Because here's the rules of capitalism. Jot this down. You can either buy and sell, or if you're in certain circumstances, you can sell and buy. If you've got ambition. Now, if you haven't got ambition, we can't cure that. And money won't cure lack of ambition. But if you've got a dollar and some ambition, I'll show you how to get rich. And even if you don't have a dollar, I'll show you how to get rich because you can sell and buy. Somebody says, as soon as the product arrives, I'll sell it. Then you don't understand. You don't understand the magic of fortune if you say, I have to wait till it gets here to sell it. And you probably don't understand the value of your own story. Once I understood that, I knew I was going to be wealthy. That's why right in the beginning, I started giving big tips. I knew I was going to be wealthy. Say, wow, this guy tips like a rich man. Say, That's right, he tips like a rich man. <laughs> Even in the beginning, I tipped like a rich man because I knew I was going to be rich. Wow. Isn't this fun? Yeah. So jot these phrases down as I close. Number one, the greatest value in life is not a bank account. The greatest value in life is not a car, a home to live in. The greatest value in life is this, make a note, living a good life. In the midst of all of our achieving and recruiting and building and growing, helping other people, being a part of society and the country and the world, being all of this stuff, 
Here's what you must figure out all of your life, how to continually live a good life. So let me give you my short list. I'll cover the long list the next time I see you. Here's the short list on a good life. Number one, productivity. If you don't produce, you won't be happy. Here's number two, good friends. The greatest support system in the world is good friends. You've got to work on that. Don't be careless here. Friends are those wonderful people who know all about you and still like you. <laughs> Here's next, spirituality. I'm not asking you to be a believer. I am a believer that humans are more than an advanced form of the animal kingdom. I'm a believer that we're a special creation. I don't ask you to be a believer, but here's what I do ask. If you are a believer, here's what you must do. Study, practice, and teach. Whatever is valuable to you, study, practice, and teach. Repeat it after me now again. Study, practice, and teach. Here's why. It builds the foundation that builds the country, that builds the nation, that helps us to compete among the nations of the world in the 21st century. And this is one of those subjects, to study, practice, and teach. Next, my parents taught, don't miss anything. Don't miss the game. Don't miss the performance. Don't miss the show, the movie. Don't miss the words. We're all inspired by the words. Elton John says she lived her life like a candle in the wind never knowing who to cling to when the rain set in. You can't miss those lyrics. You can't miss the music. You can't miss the song that nourished the soul. You can't describe how brief and fragile life is much better than that. George Harrison, one of the Beatles, sings, If not for you, the winter would hold no spring. Couldn't hear a robin sing. I just wouldn't have a clue if not for you. Wow. You've got to remember the words, the words that reflect the experience. Barbara Streisand sings, it used to be so natural to talk about forever, but used to be's don't count anymore. They just lay on the floor till we sweep them away. You don't sing me love songs, you don't say you need me, and you don't bring me flowers anymore. Illustrative of all of our experiences. Winston Churchill said, the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it and ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. You've got to use that. Feast on someone else's comments. Because, see, you could stay up all night and not think of that. <laughs> I'm asking you to do your research. I'm asking you don't miss anything. Don't miss the play. When my father was 93, just before he died, if you would have called him at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, he wouldn't be home. He's at the rodeo. <laughs> and he's watching the kids play softball. He's at church. He's watching the concert somewhere. Every night, my parents taught me that. Don't miss anything. Even the little small things don't miss. The big things don't miss. Don't miss, don't miss. It's part of living a good life. Here's why. Jot this phrase down. It'll serve you well forever. If you live well, you will earn well. If you live well, it'll show up in the texture of your voice. If you live well, it'll show up in your face. If you live well, it'll show up in the magnetism of your personality, if you live well. So don't miss the nourishment of all the things around you that could help you live a good life. Next is the inner circle. Take care of them, they'll take care of you. Inspire them, they will inspire you. Nothing more valuable than the inner circle. That's where the power to conquer the world, the world comes from, the inner circle. If a father walks out of the house and he can still all day long feel his daughter's kiss on his face, he's a powerful man. Nourishment of the inner circle is so incredible. If a husband walks out of the house and all day long he feels the imprint of his wife's arms around his body, he's invincible. Who can touch him? One person caring for another, the old, the old prophet said, is the greatest. Threat. There's many virtues and values, but the greatest is love, one person caring for another. Better to live to live in a tent on with someone you love than to live in a mansion yourself. People caring for people. And especially that inner circle where the power is so magnificent that if you draw from it, if you nourish it, and then it nourishes you. Now, here's my last comment. Ask for God's help. We could all use a little help. But my whole seminar was what you can do. 
A man took a rock pile, turned it into a fabulous garden. Somebody came and saw it and said, you know, you and the good Lord have this fabulous garden here. The gardener said, I understand your point, but you should have seen it a few years ago when God had it all by himself. <laughs> <laughs> so we do play a part. So make this the last note now. We have a chance as human beings to participate in the miracle process. We have a chance as human beings to participate in the miracle process. And you can go do that every day as often as you wish. Changing somebody's life, rescuing somebody from oblivion, building an organization second to none so that your name will appear in many people's testimonial. And that's why I came today. So that by chance, I don't need the money. That's not why I'm here. I take the money, but I don't, I don't need the money. But here's why I'm here. By chance, perhaps, if I've come along at the right time, I don't know what time this is for you, but if I've come along at the right time, just maybe, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, five years from now, you might say, Jim Rohn came by and gave us a little piece of information. That started me down the road. Here's what's happened to me. And my name might appear in your testimonial. Now, here's the drama as we finish. How many of you have my name in your notes? Here's the part of the drama, then. I go with you. When we all leave here and the lights are out and the place is dark, I go with you because you've taken my notes and hopefully some of the spirit, some of the stuff I had besides just the notes, so I go with all of you. But here's the big drama. All of you go with me. See, that's so unbelievable. So as I leave here, I promise not to leave you behind. I will take you with me in my thoughts and in my heart. God bless.